Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and here's the moment you guys have been waiting for for quite some time. We have the Galaxy S3 here, US versions. We've got the T-Mobile version here in blue and the Sprint version in white. Let's see what they look like on the back. The phones are also going to be available on AT&T and Verizon and US Cellular as well in June, and we'll take a look at those versions as well. But for starters, we're going to look at the T-Mobile and Sprint versions, and I can tell you that pretty much you're looking at the identical hardware in all these guys, and we're going to look at them now. So here they are, the Samsung Galaxy S3 US editions. As I said, really, no matter which carrier you go with, you're looking at identical hardware. The only thing that's going to vary is the cellular radio used inside and the carrier software bundle that's put on the phone. So for T-Mobile, we have their version of 4G, which is HSPA+, 42 megabit per second. And the Sprint version has 3G, EVDO, Rev A, and LTE. Now, any day now in our market, the LTE network is supposed to be lit up on Sprint. So we're hoping that we can update our written review and tell you how that is on LTE. But right now, we're just flying on 3G. The AT&T version will have LTE, as will the Verizon version, obviously, just being on different networks. GSM network for AT&T and CDMA for Verizon. All carriers are pricing them at $199 with a contract, which is pretty reasonable for a super phone here, and that's pretty much also the going rate for your basic Android super phone. What do you get for your money? You get a 720p display at 4.8 inches, that's 1280 by 720 pixels. These are Super AMOLED HD displays, not Super AMOLED Plus, so that means that dreaded pentile matrix technology rears its head. You don't get quite the pixel density if you have a pentile matrix. But given the relatively high pixel density overall, given the resolution, really, I, I'm not complaining. Things look pretty nice and sharp, but for those of you who really appreciate sharp text, you do a lot of reading, maybe ebooks, that kind of thing, something like the HTC One X with a Super LCD is going to look a little sharper and clearer. All the US versions have a 1.5 gigahertz dual core Qualcomm Crate CPU. That's a very fast CPU. Don't, don't feel bad about it being a dual core CPU because it's one of the top performers, if not the top performer in, in terms of synthetic benchmarks and also real world performance. Why is it, why is it that you don't get the Exynos CPU here? It's because Qualcomm's ready to integrate LTE radios in with the phone, so it's just easier to do that, even though well, the T-Mobile one does not have an LTE radio inside. All the other three on the big carriers do have LTE. And as a little consolation prize, just in case you still feel better about not getting that Exynos CPU, you get 2 gigs of RAM instead of 1 gig of RAM. If you're running a bazillion applications at once, more memory can always help, so that's nice. Plus the TouchWiz overlay, well, I'm sure it uses a good deal of memory. It's, it's certainly quite pervasive in skinning Android OS 4.0 Ice Cream Sandwich. The latest version of Android OS is on these phones. You get 16 gigs of internal storage. Some carriers will offer for more money a 32 gig option. And you have a micro SD card slot under the battery door, so really the amount of built-in storage isn't super duper important because you can expand it with cards, and that's, that's a great thing. That also puts these ahead of the HTC One X and the One S because those guys don't have micro SD card slots. Now if you're a Sprint person, the Evo 4G LTE does have a micro SD card slot, and that's basically Sprint's version of the HTC One X. As you can see, the phone is available in blue and in white. They call it Pebble Blue. Now, these are plastic e phones. This is Samsung, after all, and they are still in love with their plastics. While well, HTC took a real design chance with their One X series, going with that unibody design, something very forward looking, Samsung's kind of done a more curvy version of the same old for themselves. And uh, that's one complaint I've had, and I know other folks have had about Samsung's high end phones. They're really high end pieces, but, well, you're, you're still looking at something that's pretty obviously plastic. That said, this is some of the nicest plastic Samsung's put out in terms of looks. We take a look at the white one first. It's got a fairly clean design, a little bit of a curve going on, and you can really see that on the side. This silver band here creates the illusion of more curviness than there really is on the phone. And the back is genuine glossy white plastic, quite reflective. But it doesn't show fingerprints too much, given how glossy it is. Of course, white is pretty good about hiding fingerprints, so that helped. And because it is glossy, it should resist dirt and all that kind of stuff, staining. I know that some of you worry about that with your white phones. Here's your 8 megapixel camera here, your speaker grill, kind of small, but has reasonable volume. And there's your LED flash. Now we're switching over to looking at the blue one, obviously. You can see, boy, this is really very shiny. It's an interesting kind of finish. It's kind of complex. You can see fingerprints already on it. I have just cleaned it. But you can see they've got some striations here. This gives it a little bit more visual interest. Tr tries to make it look like faux aluminum. Does it succeed in looking like aluminum? No, no, it really doesn't. But kind of pretty color. 
micro USB port on the bottom, power buttons on the side, which is pretty typical for a Samsung's design, and you can imagine that the volume controls are going to be on the opposite side, so you can almost be assured that you're going to hit both the power button and the volume controls at once if you're grabbing this phone by the top. On the top edge we have our 3.5 millimeter stereo headphone jack and this is the pry point to take off the back and we'll show you that in a minute. By the way it's pretty nice Samsung actually includes a set of stereo earbuds in the box with an inline mic. In fact we'll show you the box because it's nicer than the average packaging. So the white one comes in a white, white box, the blue one comes in a blue box so regardless of carrier with both T-Mobile and, and Sprint that's the case. And it's a nice looking sturdy box so who knows what AT&T will do with theirs. You know how they really have some pretty ugly packaging. Hopefully they'll stick with this because I think a lot of people enjoy the experience of opening a, a nice looking box. We open it up and the phone obviously it sits in this section right here. You yank that up and open up your cardboard cover and you get whatever printed material the carrier includes. And here's that stereo earbud headset that I told you about and you've got a couple of extra ear gels in there as well. And we all have different size ear holes, your USB cord, and Samsung's compact charger. Not that cute little square charger they've been using for a while. Maybe they thought Apple was going to sue them over that because it looks so much like Apple's, but nonetheless, it's a fairly compact charger. The Samsung also makes some neat covers for these phones, similar to the Galaxy Note, where you get a thin flip cover and it replaces the back, and we'll show you how that works. First off, you're going to yank off the back of the phone. Which, by the way, is a little easier in previous Samsung phones to get back on. They always peel off real easy, but it used to be a little hard to get all those little plastic ears to line up and snap back in. Well, not the case anymore. So here we have our micro SD card slot, and we do have a card installed in there. It does not come with one. We put one in, though. 2100 milliamp battery. Regardless of which carrier you go with, you're going to get that 2100 milliamp battery. And obviously, you do not need to take the battery out to access the micro SD card, which is always a good thing. Otherwise, you've got plastic interior. So, here's our cute little cover case. So we just snap this guy on instead and then we have a built-in cover. And there it is, cover case. Built right in, slim, effective, not, you know, super duper rugged kind of thing, but gets the job done in protecting the screen, and there's your replacement back, which to my eyes looks just a slight bit warmer, more yellow. See the difference in the color there? It might be a little hard to see on the video between the two. Now we'll open up the GSM version just so you can see where the SIM card goes. And there is your micro SIM card and your micro SD card slot and get your 2100 milliamp battery. And while we're looking at nifty accessories, here's something else interesting. Samsung calls these tech tiles. These little peel off things and they work with NFC. All these phones have NFC. Now it's only if the carrier supports Google Wallet that you'll be able to use Google Wallet. Right now that means Sprint. But nonetheless you can do things like uh, NFC beam things to other Android phones, that kind of thing. And these tech tiles have little NFC disks inside of them. And Samsung, because I've gone to town with software here and added every imaginable feature you can think of, you put one of these on your nightstand, for example, and then you use a little app that goes with the tech tiles, and you tell it whenever it sees this particular NFC tag that it's going to put your phone in silent mode, set an alarm clock, and whatever else you would like it to do before you go to bed. So there it is. And while we're talking about Samsung custom software, those of you who've been following this phone know that Samsung has kind of thrown the kitchen sink into these devices, and uh, I, I suspect that somebody told them it's the software dummy. Look, Apple's successful because they have great software, so they decided to go off and develop a whole boatload of apps. The thing is, there's so much going on here that I don't think half of you are probably going to use that much of it that's on here, and it, you know, you're going to have to sit down, you're going to have to learn how each different application works, and in the end, some of them are a little bit more gimmicky than anything else. One of the more useful things is S-Voice, which is basically Volingo that's been customized, and it kind of tries to do a lot of what Siri does, but it doesn't have all the natural language query capabilities. Now, they've programmed it to recognize some kind of clever things that you and I just might say to the phone to see what it's going to say back to you, but really it's more of a no frills straight, do straight functions with it phone, like you can tell it to launch the calendar, what's my next appointment, what's the weather like, that kind of thing. 
But if you start getting into Siri-like uh, questions of life and all that kind of thing, well, the phone's probably just going to go, I didn't understand that. Just like Siri, it also has to connect to a server to process your command, and then it shoots back likely responses to the phone. So you can actually set the phone to actually be listening all the time, and that will consume battery power. Those of you who use that function with Lingo know that that, that can be a battery suck. Otherwise, you can set it to just start listening when you double tap on the home button. And speaking of the home button, we have physical home button keys here. They go click. We also have soft keys here. We have a menu key and we have a back key. And we'll get more into what the keys do in a minute, but that's a notable thing. So now I've double tapped on the button and it says, what would you like to do? And well, it's listening to me right now, so I'm sure it's just going to get awfully confused. I didn't catch that. Please try again. Hi, Galaxy. What's the weather outside? Now here's something. It says, say hi, Galaxy, to, to wake up the phone again. I notice that sometimes that actually doesn't really work. Sometimes you have to shout at it. Sometimes it just isn't really listening to you no matter what. And you have to touch that microphone button. Uh, not as seamless, seamless as it could be. We're just going to hit that microphone button now, though. What's the temperature outside? I didn't catch that. Please try again. What's the temperature outside? It can take a while for it to process sometimes. Again, it is dependent on your network connection. But there, look, it's got it. We forgive it that it can't pronounce Plano, and it says Plano, but there it is. It finally did do it. Now, sometimes it's a lot quicker than that. And that leads to a data connection. I noticed on both the Sprint and T-Mobile versions, which are using very different radios, that sometimes it just momentarily loses the data connection, which is a little bit strange. I suspect that can be addressed in a firmware, so I wouldn't worry too much about it now, but I have noticed it on both phones, despite the different radio hardware inside. Now let's try one more query, and I'm going to speak pretty loud here because it's a little bit hard of hearing. What's my next appointment? Here are your three appointments. Sprint 4 GLTE event at 11.30 a.m. on Thursday, June 21st, Independence Day all day on Wednesday, July 4th, and Independence Day all day on Wednesday, July 4th. So there's my calendar with my double Independence Day, which is not the phone's fault. My calendar does have a duplicate entry there. So all in all, it works pretty well, especially if you have a clear voice and you do have to speak fairly loudly. If you're in a noisy environment, uh, it gets a lot more difficult. Now let's try just one of those silly commands that people love to use with, on Siri and see what happens. What's the meaning of life? Well, it's a pretty big question, so I was going to have to think about that one for a while. <laughs> Oddly. It thinks that my next three appointments are the meaning of life. The Galaxy S3 is a light phone. Samsung always makes light phones. That is the benefit of using plastics, and they can make them pretty thin as well, which is a challenge when you've got something with a big display, a fast CPU, a fairly large battery, and yet you can still take off that back cover and access those internals. Its most direct competitor is the HTC One X, and we've got that right here, so you can see side by side we've got the One X. And we'll stick with white to white there, so. We're talking the same size. One X has a 4.7 inch display, close enough, and both about the same size. One X is heavier. Of course, the One X does not have a user replaceable battery. There's a difference. It does get points for having that super LCD display, though, which really just has better whites and is sharper to look at. Both are running at 720p resolution. And yes, yeah, so we'll, we'll be doing a SmackDown comparison between the Galaxy S3 and the HTC One X. For those of you on Sprint, you'll have to generalize a little bit. You're looking at the Evo 4G LTE there, and that gains a couple of points, like I said, for having the micro SD card slot. 
Now let's look at the user interface and what Samsung's done with it. We have TouchWiz 4 here, the latest version of uh, TouchWiz on Android OS 4.0 Ice Cream Sandwich. And as you'd expect, they've customized pretty much just about everything. Take a look at the icons. They look like your typical Samsung icons. You've got a quick launcher here, and as we mentioned, we have capacitive buttons down here. Sorry about the band-aid, little kitchen accident there. But we've got capacitive buttons, and you can set the light duration on those after you tap them. You do have to tap them to wake them up if the ambient light is pretty good. An interesting thing here, in Android Ice Cream Sandwich, the, this button has been assigned to the multitasking button. But not on Samsung. They've kind of left it the way it was with Gingerbread. So you can see you have access to your settings, create a folder, edit stuff on your home screen. If you want to do that multitasking thing, you're going to have to press and hold the home button. And then you get the standard ICS multitasking here. And the back button does back. If you press and hold the back button, nothing happens. And since it's Android, we've got our many, many home screens here. And this is the T-Mobile version we're looking at right now. So all the little T-Mobile widgets are on here. They do like to load a lot of software on lately. And you can see we get Flipboard, which has been a popular application with you guys. And we have the S gadget. Again, we got a lot of S stuff. S is for Samsung here. And that is going to suggest us applications that are currently popular right now. Not sure we really need that kind of help, but there it is. We've got a Media Hub widget, we've got a Music Player widget here. In fact, we have a whole lot of widgets on board. If we look at the app drawer, one thing they did stick with that's pretty much straight ICS is we have Apps versus Widgets tab here. Here's my Apps, here's my Widgets. Look at the dots. It tells you how many pages of widgets we have here. I have never seen so many widgets available on a phone, and I haven't downloaded a lot of third-party software, so this is pretty much coming with what you're going to get out on the phone. Now, some of them are standard Android ones, you know, calendar, uh, Google Books, that kind of thing, but there's a whole lot of Samsung stuff on here. Alarm clocks, system light widgets, their fancy planner widget here for their, their prettier version of the calendar, several clocks, direct messages, more fancy clocks, your Flipboard widget. There are so many widgets, the widgets have widgets. And if we switch back to the app drawer, one thing that I do like is well, we've got everything here. And you can customize with Samsung, which is nice, whether you want this to be a, a grid or you want icons and whether you want it alphabetized, that kind of thing. But you can just tap here and see everything that you've downloaded. So if you want to switch right away to see your downloads and not the built-in apps, that's a quick way to do it. And it's a different way of doing it than HTC does, where they have the, the three tabs that, on the bottom that switch between all applications, frequently used applications, and download applications. Both ways of doing it are pretty nice. And typical for Samsung, you can see we have control over all of our wireless radios here, which is very nice. Quick and easy, and then we've got our notifications down below. And as we take a look at the software, all the standard Google apps are on here. Google Plus, the YouTube player, Gmail, email, all that kind of thing. This is the T-Mobile one, so we can see T-Mobile applications are on board. Account management, all that kind of stuff. And we've got some Samsung applications as well. We have their Music Hub, we have their, their Movie Hub, we have their S-Memo, which is a kind of, well, nice little memo application. My Files is your file manager right here. We've got the S-Suggest application, which is the one I told you about that suggests you some applications you should download. We've got Samsung Apps, which is their own little application portals, kind of uh, overlap with, with Generally speaking, the Google Play Store, but there, there's that. And S-Voice, we've demoed to you already. And then there's some other features. Again, there's a lot of features on here. We have Samsung's own version of NFC beaming. They call that S-Beam. That only works between Galaxy S3 phones. Uh, why they do that, we're not really sure. Maybe they think the world will be overtaken by Galaxy S3 phones. After all, they already have 9 million orders on, on the books for this phone. Keys Air, well, you know what that is. That's for syncing over Wi-Fi. Works pretty well. That's normal stuff. We have their DLNA All Share for DLNA file management, media management. And then there's a there's an interesting application. It's sure to just tickle your office mate's pink. You can actually share PowerPoint presentations over a Wi-Fi network. Just great. Another way to share PowerPoint. 
And also we have things that hook into the camera. It does, it tries to do facial, rec facial recognition and if it recognizes folks after you tell them once who that person is, it will try to assign them to people in your social network if they get a match on that now. It does an okay job. Sometimes it will get one and then totally miss the next picture that's almost identical and not recognize the person. Sometimes it actually tries to recognize things like plants as people. But overall it's trying, it's trying to do that. And Probably the most neat feature after you set it up is for, say, a group of you go out to a bar or go out to a concert. If you're all linked together over Wi-Fi, well, you can actually share photographs that you're taking. Say you want to share different vantage points of shots of the same rock band or something like that. So it's kind of neat. Again, it's also kind of gadgety, and I don't know how many people are going to take up the time to, to set it up and learn it and all that kind of thing. And now to give some equal time to the Sprint version, just to see what applications are on board here. You can see we have Google Wallet, because Sprint rolls with Google Wallet, which is pretty cool. We have Visual Voicemail. We have Sprint Zone. We have the Sprint Mobile Hotspot. All these phones support the mobile hotspot, so you can use these high-speed modems for your notebook or tablet, what have you. So other than that, Sprint keeps it pretty clean. You don't get a whole lot of bloatware on here. In terms of call quality, excellent. Both of these phones. Samsung really knows how to do voice nicely on a phone. Very clear, good volume. Definitely could recommend these as voice phones, even if you don't have a very strong signal. In terms of reception on both of these phones, one being on a GSM network, one being on a CDMA network, average reception. Uh, not super duper strong, adequate, uh, not among the best reception phones that we've seen, however. Also, again, we had that little strange problem with some of those data connection just disappearing here and there for just a second or two. And the dialing interface is pretty much your standard and, of course, giant buttons since you have a very large screen here. And we've got access to our call logs, our favorites, and our contacts, so pretty straightforward stuff. And when you're in call, you have access to further features like speakerphone, switching on or off your Bluetooth, and that kind of thing. Just like the HTC One Series phones, these are fast phones. That, that's one of the top CPUs inside here, so you're not going to want too much for speed. And despite all the uh, eye candy and customization that TouchWiz is adding, really the phone f maintain responsiveness at all times. In terms of synthetic benchmarks on Quadrant, we scored 5009, which is just about identical to the HTC One X running on the same CPU. On Tutu was 6826, and pretty much close on both of these, by the way. There was no difference in performance. And this is just a little bit lower than the One X, as scored 7004. For our OpenGL benchmark Egypt off-screen test, we got 53 FIPS, which is a very healthy reading. Again, 56 FIPS on the One X. We're talking pretty close here, just a little bit slower. And SunSpider JavaScript test, 2007 was the score. Not among the best. We've seen as low as 1650 on the HTC One X, but again, right up there and respectable. Now, neither of these phones is running on LTE, so you're going to get better battery life because LTE is a big battery consumer. But we've had no trouble, not on LTE, making it through the day with pretty good use of the phone. So th that's very promising. With LTE, I suspect it's going to be something like the Samsung Galaxy S2 Skyrocket or the other LTE phones. If you're a heavy user, you're probably going to want to get a spare battery or charge it partway through the day, probably by 5 o'clock or something like that. But again, you have to have pretty heavy use to have to worry about that kind of thing. Uh, one thing to note, though, Samsung, I believe you embeds the NFC sensor in the battery rather than in the phone. So if you swap batteries out and you go to Starbucks and you can't pay for your latte, well, that would be why. The phones have front 1.9 megapixel video chat cameras, and it, you might guess from that resolution, they look pretty darn good for, for video chat. And you can use Skype, you can use Google Talk and other video chat clients with them. And on the back, we've got that nice 8 megapixel camera. Same resolution as the outgoing high-end Galaxy phones, but Picture quality is, is definitely noticeably improved, particularly we had problems with uh, white balance and contrast on the Galaxy S2 and the Galaxy S2 Skyrocket. This does a better job. It still doesn't have the dynamic range of the HTC One X, though. Another phone with a dedicated imaging sensor on it. You can shoot 1080p video as well. And again, we have that buddy share feature that we told you about where you can actually shoot photos over a Wi-Fi connection to other phones. If you're friendly with those other phones, that is. Don't worry, it's not going to shoot out to strangers. And we'll take a look at the camera now. And here's our camera interface. Big icons over here for switching between your cameras, controlling the flash. Going with autofocus. You can have macro mode. You can do face detection mode. And you can tap around to tell it where to focus, which is certainly useful too. 
And you can record video if you want, just using the slider right there. So let's record some video. And we're going to take pictures just like the HEC 1X. This has a dedicated imaging sensor. You can see there's little thumbnails down there. It's been doing both at once. If we tap over to look at that in gallery, there's the video we just shot. Not going to be the most exciting video in the world, but... Pretty good voice recording quality there. And there's the still shots that we took at the same time. And it's telling us about motion control, because of course you can wiggle the phone back and forth if you want to, to switch from one picture to another. And if we take a look at more advanced options by hitting on the little cog here, you can see self-recording, flash, recording mode. You have normal or limit for MMS. Adjust your exposure value, timers, resolution. There's your resolution options. We have anti-shake, always a good thing. Video quality. And here you can see we have shooting mo mode, single shot. You can do burst. You can do HDR mode also for better exposure in difficult contrast settings. Smile shot, beauty shot, panorama shot, cartoon, and the share shot, and buddy photo share. Now these are powerful phones. They're more than capable of playing 1080p video and any game that you're going to throw at them. And we're going to check out a video so we can show you the picture in a picture function. What did I tell you? Every feature you can think of, it's on these phones. So we're going to launch Samsung's video player so we can see the picture in a picture function that works with their video player. And we've got a video going there right now. This is a 1080p trailer. Wind it up a little bit. And so if I hit this little button right there, we'll bring it back. It's going to run it in picture in a picture mode. It's still playing right here. So, if you really don't want to stop watching that movie when uh, you need to look up a contact or something like that, you can. And you can continue to launch other applications. We go to the web browser. And we'll enter in a URL. And here we are loading our own website at the same time. Well, there's picture in a picture with the video player, and that is a 1080p MPEG-4 high-profile clip that's managing to play up there in the corner, which is pretty darn impressive. Want to go back to it? And there we go, full screen again. Speaking of the web browser, it's the usual excellent Android WebKit web browser. Speed is good. You can download Adobe Flash Player. And our screen is staying pretty white right now because we've disabled a Samsung setting and I'll show you what we mean. If you look at display here, you can see you can set your brightness, you can set your screen time out. Smart stay, aha, yet another feature. The phone can watch you and if it sees your face, it won't turn off the screen. So how many times you've been reading something, a web page, and then, well, the phone shuts off because the, the timer is hit. This way, it'll flash about every three seconds or so a little eyeball at you, a little icon to let you know that it's keeping an eye on you, and it won't shut off the screen until you stop looking at it. By the way, that feature has not seemed to degrade battery life much, so go ahead and use it. You can set your touch key light duration and font size and style. See, here's something I finally really appreciate in ICS especially. We get, we get to choose our font size, so Samsung tends to go with those huge fonts, so we can actually bring that down and see more on screen here. You can, we've unchecked auto adjust screen tone. If you have that checked, when you're looking at something that's whiter, like a white web page, it will dim it out because they'll figure, hey, this is pretty bright. You don't need that much brightness. It can also drive you a little bit insane and make things too dark. And the ambient light sensor that overall controls brightness on this is pretty much like Galaxy S2 and some other recent Samsung phones. It, it tends to keep things too dark for my liking. So it's unfortunate. I wish you could choose an overall sort of brightness level and then have it do the automatic. So kind of like, I like it on the brighter side, but go ahead and adjust it relative to conditions. But no, it doesn't do that. We take a look at data settings here. You can see we have the normal things, keys via Wi-Fi, airplane mode, VPN, tethering, NFC, Android beaming. You can turn on Sprint's, I mean, Samsung's S-Beam, Wi-Fi Direct also mobile networks 
And here, for the Sprint version, we have something a little bit different. We, you can choose whether you just want it to be CDMA or a CDMA and LTE and EVDO all together. So you can see, just in case you have LTE in your area, you can turn that on. Otherwise, turn it off. You can save battery that way. And the Sprint version has something called automatic connections. It automatically, if you go in range of Wi-Fi network that it knows, it'll turn the Wi-Fi radio on. So I guess it's always got the Wi-Fi chip on a little bit if it's uh, using that feature. Just enough so you can check for Wi-Fi connections, and it will just turn it on automatically. Which is a good thing because data speeds on Sprint's 3G network, as ever in our corner of the Dallas Metroplex, are pretty poor. I'll show you our speed test results. There they are. Now, where you are, you know what your Sprint service is like. If you t typically see better service than this, you'll get better downloads. But for us, it's, it's definitely been a godsend to have Wi-Fi, and we can't wait for that LTE. Now, here on the T-Mobile version, using their 42, bit, 42 megabit per second network, not LTE, but still really fast, other than one little strange glitch there, you can see very good speeds, over 10 megabit per second down, and they do cap uploads to give more preference to download speed, so you... You're looking at 1.2 to 1.5 megabit per second for upload speeds, but really good for not being on LTE. Ping time's kind of not good. Not sure what's up with that, but overall data speeds have been good on the phone. So that's the Samsung Galaxy S3, the long-awaited successor as well, the Galaxy S2, high-end Android phone. Still, uh, some, of, some of those things that we have been too thrilled with with Samsung are still here. We're talking plastic phone, though it feels pretty solid. Looks like plastic, feels like plastic is plastic. And we still have a Super AMOLED display with a pen tile matrix. Now, a lot of folks just like the way Super AMOLED looks. It's bright, it's colorful, that's, that's cool and all that kind of thing. So I don't think it's going to hurt Samsung too much, but black levels are great. Color balance has improved. Uh, not as cartoony and super colorful. Whites are still a little bit the weak point, and they lean toward the blue there. But still a very nice 1280 by 720 pixel display. Dual core 1.5 gigahertz Qualcomm Snapdragon crate CPU inside. Wi-Fi, dual band, 802.11bgn, Bluetooth, the GPS of course, 8 megapixel camera on the back, 1.9 megapixel camera in the front. Uh, pretty much everything you could want here, including ice cream sandwich and Samsung Touch with software. Overall, it's still a great phone. It's very fast, great video playback, great voice quality as well, so a lot going for the phone. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Visit our website for the full review of the Samsung Galaxy S3. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel.